All right, well, good morning, church, and uh, uh, I'm happy to be here once again this morning, uh, speaking from God's Word, and, and it's a it's going to be a kind of a, a touchy topic that, uh, that we're going to be touching on today. I don't know if you know, today is Sanctity of Life Sunday, and it's celebrated all over the United States. It was started uh, by President Ronald Reagan. He is, issued a presidential proclamation on January 13th, 1984. And uh, he designated Sunday, January 22nd, as the National Sanctity of Life Sunday, noting that it was the 11th anniversary of Roe versus Wade, in which the Supreme Court issued a ruling that guaranteed women's access to abortion. So I know this abortion topic is it's a it's a hot topic, um, but what does the Bible say? That's what we really uh, need to look at. What does the Bible say about human life? What does God say about human life? Um, he has a lot to say, as you're going to see. You're going to get a lot of statistics, and there are going to be some ugly statistics, some things that you might not want to hear. Um, it, it's pretty incredible the amount of abortions that happen on a yearly basis since Roe versus Wade and, and what that even adds up to. It's um, astronomical numbers, actually. And I, I, I almost want to start crying just thinking about all of those lives. Uh, but let, let me pray for us this morning before we get into this word. And uh, just that our hearts would be open. Lord, we just pray that you would open our hearts and our minds and our thoughts, Lord, to, to what you say about this topic, this ultimately what you say about life, the life that you created, Lord. And so I just pray that we all are willing to uh, set our opinions aside and just let you speak to us this morning, Lord. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. At some point, abortion has become the second most common surgical procedure, only second to, you know what, circumcision. So over 99% of all U.S. abortions have nothing to do with the life or the health of the woman. Okay, so let's get that out of the out, out of the way. 99% have nothing to do with the life or the health of the woman. They are done simply because of her desire or her uh, partners for convenience, absence, absence of distress and her so-called happiness, right? This world that we live in, that you do you, what makes you happy, what makes you feel good, you do that. We don't care if it's right or wrong. You, you know, you just do what you do. In 1995, a study was done and it showed that doctors in the U.S. performed 1.4 million, 1.4 million abortions per year. That is one per three live births. So for every abortion, for every three live births, there was one abortion. Another study done in 98 showed that doctors in the U.S. performed 1.3 million abortions, which is one for every 2.6 live, live births. 1.4 million abortions in 1995 made a 0.1% drop in 1998. And currently, we are at one abortion for every 4.9 or almost five births, which is seemingly better. But listen to this. In the first 10 months of 2023, there were estimated 878,000 abortions in the formal U.S. health care system. 94% as many abortions as were provided in 2020. So all of 2020, there was only 930,000. Approximately 88,000 abortions have been provided in the formal health care system per month so far in 2023. And so with two months of data left to be published, it's likely that that number of abortions provided in 2023 will substantially exceed 2020. And I want you to think about this. These are, these are just abortions that are performed in a clinic that people know about. There's hundreds, if not thousands more that are done under 
the radar. Also, abortion is likely to be an even larger because of the counts they don't count include abortions occurring outside the formal health care system, which are likely to have increased substantially following, following the implementation, implementation of the state bans and restrictions, right? So we made these restrictions. We've overturned Roe versus Wade. And so people are doing it on kind of like the down low. This also doesn't uh, account for the, the overnight pill, the pills that you can have now that will uh, terminate a pregnancy. All right, here we're going to get to some, some disturbing facts. And if those don't disturb you already, 1,800,000, I mean, just the thousands and thousands and thousands of lives. It is said that there have been approximately 64 million 443,118 abortions that we know of since Roe versus Wade in 1973. I, I don't know about you, but that's a staggering, staggering number. And it's going to be even more staggering once we realize just how much God loves human life. Since 1990, we have seen the abortion rates decrease, which has been a good thing. Until 200, 2017, and it rose for two years, and then it started to decline again. And you would think that that downward trend would continue, but we just looked at those statistics that in 2023, after Roe versus Wade, after we overturned the woman's right for abortion, the numbers have started to increase again. Abortion has been become so frequent that population experts say it has become, in effect, a form of birth control, which prevents a new life from beginning. So birth control should be preventing all of this from happening, right? Abortion actually destroys that new life once it's already begun. I have a video. Hopefully you'll be able to see it online. Um, and we're going to uh, show it and it's going to show us that life begins at conception. Plainly, that our life begins at conception. All right, so let's look at the, uh, the women that are having abortions. Of the women having abortions, 87% are unmarried. Okay, that's a big number. 8% are teenagers, which is good, right? And almost 30% are in their 20s. with at least 54% repeat customers, if you will. So 54% of abortions are somebody who's already had an abortion. You might be asking, you know, there's, there's the, the people out there or the, you know, this, the, that want to say, well, what about women that have been raped? What about women in incest? And I want to tell you, just 1% of women obtain an abortion because they became pregnant through rape. And less than 0.5% do so because of incest. So according, this is according to the Guttmacher Institute. Yet the battle over... Exceptions for both has garnered oversized or outsized attention in the national abortion debate. 1%, 0.5%. You know, we have also have an increased rate of abortion because of possible birth defects or things of that nature. 
Um, I want to tell you a little story about that. My brother, um, almost 17 years ago now, uh, his wife was pregnant. And they went to the hospital, you know, when, when it was time to, you know, check the age and, you know, look at different markers. And, and they came to him and said, you know, you might want to uh, terminate uh, this, abor this, this, this fetus because, well, she, uh, she could have Down syndrome. She has some, some markers that could, could have Down syndrome. Now, this was, they, they were going to do an abortion. They would, they would take this fetus because of what could happen. Well, I'm here to tell you, my, my niece is a band majorette. She leads a band. She plays, I don't know, a half a dozen instruments. She's been a straight-A student since she started school. Uh, she's just an incredible talent. And that all could have been wiped away because she could have Down syndrome, which she doesn't. How many babies, how many lives have been terminated because of something that, and I know children with Down syndrome, and they are the most loving children that you will ever see in your life. Now let's see uh, what the Bible says about some of these things. The Bible is pretty clear. In Leviticus 19, 14, it says, You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God, because I am Lord. Exodus 4, 11 says, And then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? And this is a good one. In John 9, Two through four, it says, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is, it is day, night is coming, when no one can work. God's word tells us something totally different than what the world tells us, that life is so precious in his sight, all life. It's one of the reasons why we have that seventh commandment, right, that says, thou shalt not kill. There's no exceptions there. It says, thou shalt not kill. In some ways, if you think about it, it's pretty sad that we have to have a sanctity of life Sunday. That we wouldn't just always think about a sanctity of life. That life is so precious all over the world, young and old. All right, so the first point I want to make today is that God originated human life and he sustains it. God originated, he started it, right? And he also sustains us. Genesis 2, 7 says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. It wasn't until God breathed into him that he had life. Jeremiah 1, 4 through 5 says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. He knew us before we were even conceived. The truth about human life is that God originated it. He sustains it. God originally began life through the first man and woman that he created. And he super intends every life from its earliest moments in the womb. According to Psalms 139, 15 
through 16. It says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. Intricately, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the day that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. You knew before. The days of my life before I was conceived. Galatians 1.15 says, But when he who had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace. And Romans 8.29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So once again, God so thoroughly sustains every aspect of our life. The Bible says in Job 34, 14 and 15, if he should set his heart to it and gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. So if it, God said, see fit to take his breath from us, that would be the end of it. That would be the end of all of us. But he doesn't do that. The, number, the, the second thing I want us to think about is God has printed, he has printed his image upon human life. God has printed his image upon us. The distinct factor that sets humanity apart from baboons and whales and seagulls, all other animals, is that which forms the most fundamental part of his being. God has made us in his own image. Genesis 1, 26 through 27 said, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have domain over the fish and over the sea and over the birds and over the heavens, or birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him, male and female created he them. So he says it, he makes, he makes it pretty, pretty obvious, he says it three times, that we were created in the image of God. Every single one of us was created in the image of God. Revelations 4.11 says, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. God created this earth for us. It says right here in Genesis that he put man and woman above all the other creatures of the world. Everything in the world. He made us for so, so much. And he loves us so very much. Every single life. So the image that is printed in mankind is so precious that it needs to be protected. We need to protect those who can't protect themselves. Anyone who tries to attack a man or a woman created in God's image blatantly attacks God. And God makes it very clear in his command in Genesis 9, 6. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made in his own image. Once again, God made man in his image. We are image bearers of the, the king. Every one of us. Every one of us. As soon as conception happens. The truth about human life, number three, truth about human life is that God has a plan for it. God has a plan. He's always had a plan. His plans are different than my plans. Uh, sometimes I think I have the plan all figured out, and God says, no, 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 that's not part of my plan. 
His plan was to save human life from death and destruction from the beginning. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Christ came to die so that we don't have to. For God has, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 10 says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Titus 2, 4, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, and live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all our lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. And I know uh, you know this one, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not set his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that he that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned. God loves life so much that he sent his son. He sent his son and his son, Jesus, went to the cross for every human life. Every human life is precious. Precious. At conception, it becomes human life. Conception is a miracle from God. Matthew sixteen twenty four says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would, would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So ever since the fall of mankind, man has been stuck on him or herself. That is the reason why Jesus said that we must deny ourselves so that God, God's plan could be fulfilled. So if we're living our way, right, and we're living our plans and our thoughts, we can't be doing what God has planned. Number four. God has a purpose for human life. So we look, God has a plan, and then he has a purpose. We all have, do you know you, we all have a purpose? The truth about human life is that God has a purpose for it. The purpose for human life is found both in the Old and the New Testament, all over the place. Psalms 8, 1 through 8 says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes. To still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands, the world. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, oxen and also beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. God created it all for us. And we have a purpose to take care of it. Ephesians 2.10 puts it this way. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
We are his handiwork. He has created us. None of us are a mistake. None of us are a mistake. Unplanned pregnancy or not is not a mistake. God does not make mistakes. He prepares us for good works. Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Proverbs 19, 21 says, many are the plans of a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. We, we plan all the time. And God's plan and purposes are different sometimes than ours. Well, for me, it's most of the time. And this, uh, I'm going to finish with this verse. This is one of my favorite verses. Uh, and this kind of sums up this whole sermon. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a, a purpose, a future, and a hope. I know the plans I have for you. He knew those in advance. Before you were conceived, before I was conceived, he knew that I would be standing in front of you today. He knew that I would be a drug addict and an alcoholic and all kinds of evil. But ultimately, through him, I've been saved and I've changed. And he's working in me more and more every day. So I hope you can clearly see why abortion is wrong. Life is precious. It is wrong because every human life originated by God. Every life that was and every life that's going to be is originated by God. And he has promised to sustain it. And every human life is printed with God's image. Every single one of us is made in the image of God. And lastly, God has a plan and he has a purpose for you, for me. Pretty pretty hard topic to swallow. And I know that there's people on both sides of the street, but hopefully it's brought you to the middle. Because what does the Bible say about life? That's what ultimately we should be thinking about. What is biblical? What does God say? Not what is your opinion. Not what makes you feel good. But what does God say about it? We have, I have an opportunity. I'm going to share a little something from you from uh, uh, Peak Women's Care. I don't know if you remember. You, you've heard about this. This is this, uh, this clinic that we're trying to start up in uh, Portola. And uh, they uh, had this idea. It says, uh, let's see, in October 2022, I shared a vision that God had placed on my heart to open a place for women who were seeking an alternative to abortion a safe place where they could come to receive help, support, love, and to choose life for their unborn child. In one short year, that vision has been embraced by so many people, so many people that have stepped forward to support in time and resources. And weeks and, and peak women's care has become a reality, not just a dream. In October this year, they held their first fundraising dinner. And through that, they raised over $200,000. They have purchased a medical clinic. It was a dental office at one time. Providing pregnancy testing, life-saving ultrasound, 
and services to women and men in need of help to choose life for their children. This will be a big step, but the building is, is well designed, well built, an excellent investment towards future sustainability for peak women's care. We hope, we hope to close ex, escrow in mid-February, and of course, we'll plan a, a, an amazing open house to share with all of you. They have a doctor, Dr. Ally, Ollie Hunt has stepped up to be the medical director. But they are in need of some help. And this is where some of you can step up and protect these lives that can't protect themselves. They're seeking key roles such as an executive director, RNs, RDMSNs, or RDMSs. Those are licensed ultrasound techs, if you don't know. Staff and trained volunteers to act as client advocates, assisting clients in informed decisions affecting their unborn children. The board also has a vacancy. They need a person with a variety of talents, fundraising, community connections, administration skills, and foremost, love for Jesus Christ. If you feel called uh, to any of those things, or if you feel called to uh, help financially, um, let me know. And, and I'll point you in the right direction or, or talk to Pastor Matt. We have a, a, a link that you can go to to help support Peak Women's Care. This is a way that we here in this valley uh, can combat, can fight against the death of children, the death of human souls that don't ever have a chance. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for who you are and what you've done for us through your son, Jesus Christ. We're thankful for life, Lord, that you, you breathed it into us, Lord. You breathe this into existence. Lord, I do pray for those who can't pray for themselves, Lord, who can't defend themselves, Lord. I pray that you would help us to fight for those lives, Lord. Give us the strength to stand up, to speak out against this wrong, Lord, because you just love life so much. So much that you sent your son, Lord, so that we might not perish, but have everlasting life. Lord, I just pray for the rest of our week, Lord. I pray for, for those who are struggling, for those who are sick. I pray that you would give them strength. I pray for those in need, Lord, that they would reach out we would love to help them. They would just reach out. We love you and we thank you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name.